Thank you. It's great to be here with everybody. Thank you, Carson, and congratulations to you and the SIGA team for pulling a very impressive group together. I looked quickly at the list. I, I know some of you here somewhere, um, and uh, you are from the, the NGOs, the institutions, the universities that have put forward a lot of information, evidence, and data that I've consumed over my career. And so, big caveat, in case it wasn't clear, um, from that introduction, I am probably the only non-social scientist researcher in the room, evidenced by I don't have any slides, um, <laughs> but I have been for 30-some years an avid consumer of, a uh, champion of, and great believer in the power of data and evidence to help us do a better job and to help us change course when we need to because our strategies are not working which is sometimes really difficult to do. Um, so it's really terrific to be here with everybody. And um, you know, interestingly, I was starting to, after I spoke to Carson, think about, oh, okay, this is a good chance to think back over many, many years of being in all the places Carson mentioned. And my connection to working in, on, and around conflict really started with the Balkans War, first with Bosnia and then with Kosovo. And so right as I started thinking about this, I, I, by coincidence, got an email from an old colleague of mine who I haven't talked to for a decade or more, who I worked with during those conflicts. Um, and Lowell uh, spent his whole life working around humanitarian assistance and peace building. He retired, and now he's come out of retirement to work uh, as a teacher in a university in Lithuania. And he, he wrote, saying, um, you know, I came out of retirement and I find myself fielding the students' questions, and they come from the Baltics, Central Asia, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Balkans, and the Middle East, and they're asking me, does it really matter? Does development work stick? Why should I care about peace and development theory when back home uh, NGO colleagues are being arrested, there's limited freedom of expression, there's limited collective action, and human rights are violated. And Lowell went on, the pain and anger behind their questions breaks my heart, and sometimes I wish I had stayed retired. And I'm sure that every one of us who have worked on the front lines of a conflict feel the same thing. Um, you, you know, you don't spend a lot of years after your first conflict into your second, third, dozens of conflicts, not ask yourself, how do, we, how do we get ahead? How do we not just respond to the conflicts in a better way, but how do you work on preventing those conflicts? And how do you break these really destructive, endless cycles that keep pay, taking people down over and over again? And when you spend very much time in refugee camps and you see just this raw pain and impossible courage of the families and the women and children who are still persevering despite losing everything. It, 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 it makes you really, really want to have the best information possible um, so that it does matter, so that things can get better. And, and in thinking of how to respond to Lowell, you know, he said, just a quick question. Do you, what do you think? I'm like, okay, I'll think about that for a couple of decades. but. Um, I think it has gotten better, if I think over my 30 years, in the way that we're able to respond to crisis. I, if I think back to 30 years ago, we have learned a lot. Um, we have brought a lot of evidence forward. I think NGOs, the UN system, the universities have all really dug deeply into these questions. Um, and I think we've made significant progress. I think where we still have a very, very steep challenge is not just understanding how to prevent conflict, but how to make it stick in really complex bureaucracies and international systems. So I just wanted to throw a few stories down for us to think about and hopefully to seed what I know is a really, really rich afternoon of conversations and total awe for all of you who are doing this work. Um, but I do think that evidence has helped us um, craft approaches and strategies that enable a much faster, much more useful and often innovative response to crisis and displacement. And I think back to, and a number of you hopefully are users and consumers of this, 
the 1985 innovation of the famine early warning system. Does everybody know about FuseNet? So because of FuseNet, that completely changed how we and the rest of the, of the donor world were able to respond to crises faster and earlier by prepositioning food, by using predictive data so that we knew about rainfall and droughts that might be imminent. Um, so, and also the work that was done uh, can, uh, as a part of that to really nail down the IPC classification system and uh, do a very clear and specific definition of what famine was. Um, and, I, and I bring that up because one of the most uh, difficult moments of my life, or let's say difficult months of my life, was when I was at USAID in 2010-2011. And in, in the fall of 2010, FuseNet first indicated that famine could be on the horizon in the Horn as one of the worst droughts in 60 years was cycling back through that region, and they still hadn't recovered from the drought of a few years prior. And through the fall, the FuseNet reports got more and more dire. But although we, as the United States, were moving food into Ethiopia and Kenya, we were not moving food into Somalia, because as you might recall, that was in the days of Shabab um, dominance and uh, US OFAC sanctions prohibited any material support from reaching Shabab. So nobody in the administration was in a position or willing to lift the sanctions and enable food to get into Somalia. So by, so, so you fast forward to June of 2011 and the alarm bells were ringing. The, the actual technical definition of famine, which it means that thousands and thousands of people have already died, mainly children under five, was about to happen. And I remember, you know, we spent, at USAID, we spent months trying to unlock this and get the food moving. And I was invited to a White House Situation Room meeting with the deputies, and I was able to bring big maps that had bright red in those districts of Somalia and indicate how many people were dying on a daily basis. I think we were 10,000 a month already, mainly children. Put those maps on the table at the deputies um, in the Situation Room. And everybody just looked at it. And you, know, you can have a lot of really technical information and data, but it's really powerful when you put it in those kinds of stark terms. And John Brennan, who was then the director of the CIA, sort of slowly looked up and he said, you know, our counterterrorism policies are meant to save lives, not, not to destroy. And the sanctions were lifted like that week, and we were able to move food in. So it's the, it's the power of well-presented evidence to unlock even complicated, highly political uh, policies that I have really taken, that, that was one of the most powerful moments of being able to bring evidence and change a policy from the highest levels. And that whole response, I think, you know, really accelerated a number, a lot of research into how to do a better response because getting into Somalia was so difficult. It turbocharged our understanding of how to do cash instead of stuff um, because we were able to get cash even into the markets of Somalia. That served us well when we went into future conflicts in Yemen and Syria. It's become pretty standard now because of a lot of the research that a number of folks probably here in this room did. But a lot of NGOs really worked together to understand how uh, folks were able to do that. So that in Syria, we gave credit cards or debit cards to the refugees so that they had greater dignity and could go to the supermarkets to buy what they needed. Um, and I'm still actually a little amazed now that I'm looking more at a domestic environment at the fact that we are so reliant here on food banks and we still make people line up for food. I, I can't figure out why we're not bringing some of these approaches here. But the other thing that the drought did is really helped us uh, um, bring back greater focus on resilience. And in the early 90s, there had been droughts in the Horn of Africa that had started some of the thinking about how do we get ahead through different kind of development work never stuck. The evidence that was brought forward couldn't penetrate the bureaucracies and the stovepipes 
of humanitarian and development. In 2011, we looked at the data in Kenya and the arid dry lands uh, of Kenya, which mainly where the Somalis live and the herders live, um, were you know, historically marginalized and underdeveloped, and that's where the drought was really hitting. And for the past decade at USAID, we had put half a billion dollars a year into that region of humanitarian assistance half a billion dollars a year. If you looked at our development budgets, zero, zero development money in these regions that were just hammered by cycles of drought. And so in um, the World Bank estimated that even though these were highly marginalized areas, they were not included in the Kenya National Development Plan, that the economic loss to Kenya was $13.2 billion from that drought. And so it really shifted everybody. So that accumulation of evidence and data was very powerful in making it clear that a development approach that only invested in the south, the highly productive southern regions, uh, was not going to work. And it began the beginning, uh, it began, to, uh, it began this, this coalescence around resilience approaches that I'm sure a number of you have ver been very deeply in engaged with. And it's resilience both to natural disasters, but also greater resilience to different conflicts. And it really is about thinking differently about how we do the humanitarian and development efforts, and we bring them together so we're not just feeding people or digging boreholes or taking care of people after they've been displaced, but help them not to have to leave in the first place. Um, and that was a, was a huge and significant policy shift that made a, a significant difference. Um, okay, so here we are. Uh, Carson cited to you the extraordinary uh, statistics about how high levels of displacement are and the number of conflicts that we have. Um, you know, we're not making progress on getting ahead of what are continuing to be spiraling humanitarian crises and levels of displacement. And so, to me, the critical question is, what do we know about getting ahead of conflict and how do we do a better job of not just doing the response, not just doing resilience um, or, or mitigation, if we want to talk about it in the climate sense, but how do we get ahead of it all? And so if I think back to 2011, um, you know, the MDGs were coming to a close. We were starting to look ahead, and they'd already had these extraordinary accomplishments, as you recall, cutting child mortality in half, cutting extreme poverty. Um, but when you looked at the data, and all of you can recite this along with me, we saw that the progress was not happening in, in a group of the most extremely poor countries that all shared attributes of terrible state society relationships. Um, and that led to the renegotiation of the SDGs with goal 16, my favorite goal ever. Um, but there was this really seminal report by the World Development um, by the World Bank, the 2011 World Development Report. How many of you have read that? Yeah. So that, that to me was earth shaking. And if for a group of researchers, you, you know, to me that's like gold standard of taking a lot of evidence, putting it in a package that was powerful and profound in terms of shaking up how people thought about the development enterprise from the context of how do we address these core issues of fragility that are resulting in the continued cycles of conflict and displacement. And instead of focusing on that end, how do we get ahead of that? And it had a series of prescriptions that to this day, I think, um, are, are still the right list, you know, which is, um, you know, invest in citizen security, justice and jobs, institutional legitimacy, uh, think of a layered approach, country up to international, um, and think about the regional institutions and the multilateral institutions. That's my two-second two summary. Um, following that, and some of you probably were deeply involved with this, there was a whole list of big paradigm shifts that happened as a result of that evidence, from 
World Bank to IMF to USAID to DFID, you know, a series of reports that said we can do this differently, we must do it differently, evidence, ideas. Um, even the U.S. Congress passed the Global Fragility Act in 2019. Okay, but we still have all of this evidence that conflict is increasing. Um, and we have the Ukraine war. And so what I would submit to you is that it, conflict, as we all know from our research, is a very long, long time horizon to get out from under it, to break those cycles of conflict, to address the underlying fragility. Lots of great research that more deeply into fragility. But it takes a, it takes a, a, a big shift in the institutional bureaucracies to get past the stovepipes and to get shared understandings of what is it that we're all actually trying to do. When you have development enterprise over here and humanitarian enterprise. Even there, we have stovepipes and problems talking to each other, but then you add in security, military, and then diplomacy, and everybody starts working across purposes. So I would submit that we need to make sure that the evidence and the ideas that we're bringing forward, A, are speaking as vividly as possible to the humanitarian, but also the development people, but also to the to the security and to the diplomacy people. And think about the kind of evidence that can help shape that understanding of what practices are helping to promote or to, to promote fragility uh, and to undercut our other efforts. And then finally, you know, we've got Ukraine and Russia now, and the paradigms are changing again. And after a decade and a half of looking at fragility and terrorism, it's all back to great power conflict again. And we're, even as Ukraine is creating unbearable impacts on energy and food insecurity in the most fragile environments with the potential for triggering a whole new round of conflicts within those countries. Um, the focus is for good reason on, you, on the Russia and Ukraine conflict in the new national security strategy that came out yesterday in the summary at least, for the first time in more than a decade, does not talk about state fragility as an issue to think about. So the, the spotlight is about to shift before we've really solved the problem. And so the big challenge to people who are providing and pulling together this great evidence to shift policies is not to lose track when, you know, because the short attention span of policymakers, you have to keep bringing it back to if we really do want to prevent conflict, how to think about that, um, and do it in ways that really penetrates and gets through um, with your data. And I would say to Lowell, it matters. It, you know, it, it takes a long time, and you could get depressed about it, but we really don't have a lot of alternatives. Um, and so just huge admiration for the work that you all do and an exhortation to continue doing it as powerfully as you can. Thank you. Questions for Nancy? I see one in the back. <laughs> Hi, uh, Rafi Najm from Oregon State. I grew up in Afghanistan, so doing my grad school at Oregon State University. So the question I have, definitely we have a lot of evidence in terms of development efforts and as well conflict, how it affects individuals and communities. But as we see last year, the turmoil that happened in Afghanistan and suddenly everything that we have achieved or every effort that has been put in place got to get disconnected. And now a lot of communities has been impacted significantly negatively. So what are some of the advices that you have from your practice uh, in this field that we can sustain in the and strategies that we can institutionalize these development efforts and degrade it into the community rather than keeping it with uh, NGOs, which unfortunately happens a lot of the time. Thank you. Thanks. Um, that, is, that is such a good question. And I, I want to just start by citing, um, and I see my co former USIP colleague is here, David. Um, I, I think Afghanistan has so many lessons for us, and I know you're going to hear from 
Tariq Ghani about one of those lessons uh, later today. But I was very informed and, and um, I found it to be very powerful, a piece of work that former USIP colleagues did in 2015, 2016, where um, with, with, they looked at data from the prior decade and came to the inescapable conclusion that during that decade, all of the development work, which was focused on state building, building civil society and institutions, was going on in one lane and in another lane, the military was fighting the Taliban. And in another lane, the intelligence services were hunting Al-Qaeda. And the practices of these two lanes were fully undermining any effort to rebuild the state because there was a lot of cash being handed around. Corruption was fueled. It, there was never an ability to generate confidence of the citizens in their state. So I say that as a prelude to answering your question because I think we lost a lot of time in Afghanistan because there wasn't a shared understanding of how do you help a country come out of that kind of conflict and a misunderstanding of how to address violent extremism based on a lot of the evidence that I'm persuaded by. It, it, to your question about how do you move from NGOs doing the work to local communities taking the lead. Is that the heart of your question? Yeah. There you went. Yeah, I mean, I think that is a big question that has been guiding and troubling NGOs for several decades. And it's, you know, it's locally led, it's localization, it's decolonization, it's been called different things. I think everybody recognizes that. And I believe that that has shifted a lot in the some several decades that I've been doing this. Um, and uh, the, whole, the whole effort of supporting civil society and supporting local communities is a really critical approach and one that there has been good research on and better ways of doing that. Um, I think that sometimes when the international community gets caught up in the urgency of humanitarian response, you'll lean in again on the international structures because of the urgency and you think you don't have time. And that's where the resilience agenda, coupled with the fragility approaches, is really important. And Afghanistan may provide yet another learning moment when we, there's a need to think differently uh, you know, now that we're back at the situation that we are. But what I worry about, and this, uh, this week, I'd love to have this conversation because I, been working in Afghanistan since the mid-90s, um, is uh, there's been such a brain drain, right? So, so I, I have less awareness of how to reseed the, 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 the person capacity that's been lost in Afghanistan as like a double, triple loss. I actually think a lot of capacity was built. Um, including through education. And my last visit there, which was right before the pandemic, I went to the uh, couple of the universities there. Unbelievable energy, hope, and optimism. It's really heartbreaking. Thanks. Uh, my name is James Mukoki. I'm a visiting fellow at uh, SEGA from Makere University, Uganda. From uh, I'm from Makere University in Uganda. Uh, I'm just uh, thinking out loud. Um, you said you have uh, connections to the higher authorities. I'm thinking the, the cost, uh, if you compare the cost benefit analysis of uh, detecting an occurrence of a uh, conflict, preventing it, and then um, compare it to humanitarian aid, the money that pe the West spend to respond. Um, using, uh, for example, the intelligence community, which can detect that in such a, a situation and uh, a conflict may occur. Like, for example, what you talked about in Ukraine and Russia. I think it was known for a long time that it will take place. Why not use models to detect and prevent than responding to humanitarian crisis? Thank you. 
It, well, d let me make sure I heard your question. Is, is the question why don't we use more money to prevent instead of to respond to crises? Like, like, uh, yeah, that is part of it, but using the, the, the intelligence community, like for example, the US has the best intelligence community, detecting that a conflict will take place, prevent it, than responding to it after. I think the cost in terms of money and human life is more than preventing it to occur. Absolutely, no, the, absolutely, and there has been, there has been really useful research on how much it costs to prevent conflict as opposed to respond to conflict that, you know, I have taken up to the hill more than once. Um, and if I recall it correctly, it's, a do, it's five dollars of response uh, versus one dollar of prevention, or some form, it's been a while, but um, I think it's a World Bank, World Bank data point. Um, that on its, I think that on its face isn't convincing enough, because sometimes it takes the urgency and, uh, of a crisis to get people to act. And I go back to my story about the Somalia famine. It wasn't until the, the map was bright red that we could get people's attention. And so the challenge is, is, is both how do you get people's attention, and then if you get their attention, do you really have what you need to prevent the conflict? And of course, every conflict is different and highly granular. Um, I would put this Russia-Ukraine conflict in a, a really different category than the internal conflicts in a fragile state. And that, that was part of my point that you know, we're swinging back to a world of great power conflict where there will be less attention and fewer resources for the kind of internal conflicts that have really created most of the displacement over the last 25 years, um, probably 30 years. The Ukraine refugees have turbocharged that number um, but it is a very different kind of conflict, and it's less of a development question. Um, taking care of the, responding to the needs of the Ukrainian refugees, I think have been informed by a lot of hard, work, hard lessons uh, and good improvements over the decades, but getting ahead of that is a really different set of, of questions. But Uganda has been on the foreground of a lot of care for refugees and a lot of coming out of its own conflict in the north that has lessons, I think, for all of us, that the northern Uganda conflict.